Good afternoon and thanks for joining us on Media Life. I am Wendy Lai. Our headlines for this afternoon. Police administration starts deploying more men to land guard prone areas to deal with the menace. Persons arrested for planning sex party at a hotel in Accra risk up to three years in jail if found guilty of charge of prosecution, a criminal offence in Ghana's criminal court. And for international news this afternoon, U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis says threat of nuclear attack from North Korea is increasing. We have details of these stories and many more lined up this afternoon. Do stay with us. We start with our stories and statistics available at the Ministry of Food and Agriculture indicates that 58% of poultry products consumed in Ghana are imported from the EU and the United States. But how does one ensure the safety of the products in the wake of rotting poultry on the markets? On October 23, a consignment of rotten frozen chicken was declared unsafe for human consumption after discovery on the Ghanaian market. Similar cases happen usually when the yule tide is approaching. In the recent incident, the Food and Drugs Authority says it has destroyed the whole consignment and are certain none could be found on the market. FDA rather will make sure that those products, if they are found to be unwholesome, do not be on the market. That's what we must do. I agree that the consumer has to play its role by checking that in case it gets to the market, it will be able to identify it. But for that, I cannot comment on that now. However, he could not give any specific indications as to how consumers can identify any of the rotten frozen products on the market. At this point, it is the responsibility of the consumer to ensure that he or she is buying the right product. But what are the factors they consider before making a purchase? The news team visited some markets within the municipality to ascertain some of the precautionary measures consumers consider when purchasing frozen poultry products. For fish, if it has blood around the mouth, then it is bad. Who doubt about the chicken you are buying? If you are not sure, smell it and you will know if it is bad or good. But what do traders consider before making a purchase for sale? We always make sure we check the expiring date. Aside that, we open the box to make sure that we are buying fresh product. Clearly, there is no scientific method for one to check how safe a frozen product is for consumption. The honors lies mainly on consumers to apply experience in making the right choice. For TV3, Kwabna Edu Jenfi, Accra. And UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, is working with the authorities in Ghana to support recently arrived Togolese asylum seekers fleeing the recent political unrest in their country. Asylum seekers have been registered by the Ghanaian authorities after arriving in remote northwestern parts of Ghana, including Chirponi, Zapsugu and Bumpuguyoyo. The majority of them are being hosted by local families and some in community centers. So Gulis seeking safety, including women and children, said they were fleeing human rights abuses after the recent political protests. Let's go to the phone line and speak to Dr. Kofi Anani. He's with the Ghana Refugee. That's the board executive secretary. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks for your time. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Can you kindly speak up? Now, yes, how many refugees have arrived since the latest surge in political protest over there in Togo? Yeah, can you please come again? I can't hear you. Now, I'm asking that how many refugees have arrived from Togo since the last surge in political protest there? Uh, we have a, a, we noticed a movement across the border. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use our refugees because we have around 500 uh, people who have crossed over to 
Ghana, and we are dealing with them right now. As we are speaking, uh, we have a mission compi uh, comprising of Ghana Refugee Board, the UNHCR, as well as NADMO, that are uh, on the ground mm. having an assessment and gathering data, registering them over there. But then let's refrain from using the word refugee because refugee, to be a refugee, you have to go through a process, assess, and given a status. Right now, let's say we have movement across the borders. Movement across the borders? Yes. All right. Well, now, are they residing with relatives in Ghana or the refugee board is helping take, take care of them? Where exactly are they? But I can, I can hear you clearly. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, but then it's not very clear from your end. Can you please can you reposition your yourself? Again? Can you repeat your question again? Okay, I'm asking that, are they residing with relatives in Ghana, or where exactly are they as we speak? Okay, yes, uh, they are in the five districts uh, in the northern region. Um, we have two or three main immediate responders that have provided support to them. You have host communities, local communities, that they, where they are. We have the, the respective district assembly that have also provided preliminary uh, uh, assistance, and as well as NADMO, which is on the ground. So they are in five districts in the, in the north, Natali, uh, Chirimponi, and then uh, one other place that I can uh, get hold of right now. So, so they, are, they are in the northern region. Uh, we are assessing the situation. And then uh, my team will be back here in Accra tomorrow. And then we will need, because we were told that the first responders that have provided assistance have, uh, you know, they need more, um, more support in order to be able to continue if the situation uh, deteriorates, in order to be able to continue providing them with immediate assistance and preliminary assistance. So we are assessing the situation. And as soon as they are back, we'll know exactly the specific things that are needed. And we will work with all the other uh, agencies that are involved. At the moment, we just had an a, a interagency meeting, data uh, coordinated by the UN resident coordinator. And uh, all the agencies that are, uh, are within the UN system have been uh, alerted, and are including the uh, WSP as well as uh, our partner UNHCR and uh, we are all working together in order to ensure that we provide adequate assistance all right. as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Kofi Annani. He is Executive Secretary with the Ghana Refugee Board. You're still watching Media Life to one of our headline stories. And CEO of Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesi Ajiman, says the authority has intensified its monitoring following the recent reports of sex parties held at some registered facilities across the country. My colleague Alfred Okansi spoke with him on News 360 on Friday and began asking him when the authority became aware of the growing trend of sex parties here in Ghana. Let's take a listen to him. We've been monitoring uh, the space in terms of um, activities happening in various hotels and establishments that we license. And we've seen some communication going on on social media um, advertising um, sex parties. And so we set in place a task force to monitor and try and track them as part of our enforcement activities, uh, monitoring especially the hotels. When it happens within an establishment that we license, and in this case a hotel, uh, a nightclub, or a restaurant, and we have to take the necessary steps to stop it, and that is what the task force has been mandated to do. Now, the question was being asked, I mean, th th this, is, this has been going on. I mean, th this uh, social media publication of such parties has been going on for quite a while now. I recall some that happened in Kumasi, uh, some also in Takradi as well, which we saw openly advertised on social media. Now, so uh, why did it have to take you this long? It's not taking us this long. You know, sometimes, I mean, we've been tracking. For example, this particular incident of uh, this lady calling herself Ginger Cameron. Uh, we've been tracking her. But whenever they advertise 
we send people there because sometimes you want to see that it's happening. It's not just uh, somebody photoshopping something and putting it out there on social media. So we've been tracking. We go around. Sometimes our uh, uh, guys go there and nothing happens. There's uh, no show. Sometimes once somebody calls the line and they feel that it's a strange call, then they abandon the plan. So we've been on their heels for some time now. And, you know, chasing up on some of these activities takes time. And we're happy that at least we just didn't stop it. We have somebody in custody. So the law enforcement agencies will then follow up with the necessary investigations to make sure that this thing is stopped once and for all. And Section 279 of the Criminal Code 1960 Act 29 has a as amended by Act 554, Section 15, states that it is criminal for any person to engage in prostitution. And a private legal practitioner says persons arrested could be charged for misdemeanor and jailed for three years if found guilty. He spoke with my colleague Stephen Anti on News at 10 Friday night. Under our law, it is against the law for a person to live wholly on income and from prostitution. So as far as I'm aware from the adverts that I saw, you could see that certain sexual acts were advertised and prizes listed. So where you say you want to do certain, undertake certain, certain sexual acts for certain prizes, then you're certainly going in the direction of illegal conduct. So that is why the tourism uh, authority rightly uh, closed down the hotel, because they are the ones who license the hotel to operate. If you, uh, those who are uh, procuring uh, prostitution, so pimp, those who pimp them up, fine, and then being a misdemeanor up to three years imprisonment, yeah, so from five up to three years imprisonment for the pimp, okay, and then the prostitutes themselves, they say. So if you, if the police round up those persons and have them prostituted, that is what they would face. You still watching Media Live, we have more shortly. Thanks for staying. And the Ministry of Health has been urged to facilitate the completion of a strategic plan of human resource to ensure equity in healthcare delivery. This follows the launch of a monitoring report on client satisfaction and health service delivery. It is also called the Ghana Health Service to increase on monitoring efforts at health facilities to ensure adherence to the code and ethics as well as conduct. And this afternoon, I have been joined in the studio by the Director of Policy Advocacy for Sen Ghana, Clara Osei Boating. Good afternoon. Thanks for your time. Good afternoon. Now, what necessarily has, um, what has what about this client satisfaction for health service delivery survey? Um, as you know, Sen Ghana is a research and advocacy organization. And one of our projects, which is in collaboration with the Global Partnership for Social Accountability through the World Bank, um, essentially our focus is to facilitate citizens' engagement in government on services delivery, to provide feedback to government as to whether or not they are getting quality services, access issues, and all that. And so the focus is on health and education. So as one of our monitoring um, projects that we did um, was to look at uh, delivery of services at health centers um, and f health facilities, basically looking at CHIPS, uh, clinics, uh, polyclinics, and uh, hospitals. And the uh, reason is that, you know, over the years we hear uh, people are not being treated well at health facilities or people are not even uh, uh, patronizing health services. So we wanted to explore what is going on. And a key uh, indicator we looked at, uh, we've heard our healthcare providers say that there's so much pressure on us and therefore uh, this, the reason for some of the attitudes that our healthcare workers put up. So one of the things we look out for was to see the number of health uh, care workers 
that government is spending on. Essentially to look at how much of our budget is actually being spent on health uh, workers. And if you look at it, the health sector is the second is taking the second largest of the national budget. And yes, they're, they're yeah, confronted with all these absolutely, challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. And the uh, education is first, health sector is second. And we look at 2014 and 2015 and 90% averagely of the health sector budget were spent on uh, compensation, mm. which is a concern because when 90% is spent on human resource, what is the or what is left to be used for serv actual services delivery? And so you have situations where the health uh, care workers are there, but the goods and services uh, in terms of things to work with are not there. People yeah. are crying over simple uh, gloves and you know. Uh, but there will be time, do you, basic do you things. see us making any headway at all? Because sometimes some of these issues come up, but after a while, it's just swept under the carpet. For instance, the patient shutter, this has been there for years. How many health personnel even know that there is a shutter they have to go by? Do patients here in Ghana even know that they have a shutter that you can always hold health personnel accountable to? That's why organizations like us are always there to remind duty bearers of their responsibility. It's true, we've had interaction with some health workers in the past who didn't even know about the patient charter. In some cases, the charter was boldly pasted there, but they hadn't even taken notice of it. So then it, it brings us to the issue of training. How are these people trained to be able to deliver a service, the human factor? Uh, aspect of their work. So that is also important. Um, but essentially, um, this is also to uh, raise awareness that in the healthcare delivery has a standard, it has code of ethics, it has patient data that has to be complied with. And so people must be aware, as citizens, we must be aware this is being done to raise an awareness of our rights and also to prompt government to do more in terms of training healthcare workers to respond to citizens' demand. Mm. Um, but uh, clearly one of the uh, issues that came out in the report is the availability of um, healthcare, workers, especially doctors and nurses. Um, in Ghana, the ratio of uh, doctor to nurse is pretty high. We have one, on average, we have one doctor to 11,000. But then if you look at the uh, regional differences, that is where there is a big challenge. Uh, Greater Accra region and Ashanti region seem to be enjoying at the expense of um, other regions, poorest regions like Upper West, Upper East, Northern region and the rest. And so you have, say, in Accra, one doctor to about 2,000 or, uh, or 3,000 doctors. And then you go somewhere in the Northern region or Upper East region and we are talking about one doctor to 32,000 uh, patients. Now, you, 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 you have given, if I should cut you there, you have given this report out, yes. obviously, to the various stakeholders. Yeah. How are you going to ensure that they follow your, you know, the pointers you've given? The recommendations. And the recommendations you've given to the latter. Yes. We've already taken initiatives. In fact, we were first going to present this report. We met with the Minister of Health, and he actually approved for us to present the reports at their review meeting a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, the agenda was so packed that they couldn't make time for us to do that. Um, but usually what we do as send is that having launched the report, which is what we did this week, then we are going to engage the various levels of uh, duty bearers. So we would have a national dialogue involving the Ministry of Health, the Parliamentary Select Committee on Health, uh, Ghana Health Services, to share the report and to push them to commit to address more of the issues. Already when we launched the report on Tuesday, we had re representation from all these institutions. Um, the uh, Director General was represented by the Greater Accra uh, Director, and she made some commitments that they were going to ensure that uh, the Code of uh, Ethics is well followed. Um, in Ghana, it's about supervision too, because most of these healthcare workers we see in the public uh, institutions putting up attitude are also working in private institutions. But when you meet them, there is a different story altogether. What does it mean? It means that supervision is also an issue there that needs to be looked at. So all these things put together, um, we will continue to engage at all levels. At the same time, educating citizens about their rights so that they can de demand fair treatment when they visit these facilities. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. I have been speaking to the Director of Policy Advocacy for SEND Ghana, Clara Osepati.
We're grateful for your time. You're still watching Me De Live. And let's move on to other stories. The chief of the chief, Ni Adutewe, Ni Atukwe II, an operator of some public toilet facilities in the Lejokukukro Municipal Assembly in the Greater Accra region, has threatened to take legal action against the Municipal Assembly. Now, this follows the taking over of some public toilets in the area by supporters of the New Patriotic Party, which a letter signed by the Municipal Chief Executive of the Assembly, Madame Evelyn Na, Ajele indicated. Now, here's a report by Sarah Paco. Over 200 public toilet facilities in Teshi and Nungwa have been taken over by NPP activists in the Lejukuku Krawa Municipal Assembly. The persons who perpetrated the incident in the early hours of Friday are claimed to be holding a letter signed by the municipal chief executive of the area, Madam Evelyn Na Ajele Chum Dramira. The news team were confronted by a group of persons in one of the public toilet yards. The new caretakers who look happy at their new jobs confidently tell us they are members of the NPP and that they are taking over. I'm an NPP woman organizer, police station woman organizer. I'm just a volunteer. They said they want to know the amount for the day. That's the reason why they want me to be here for one week. I'm very happy to get I'm here until they say I should. Residents of the area, however, expressed worry at the situation. Chief of the Ni Odatewe, Ni Otukwe II, who happens to be one of the operators, says he has already informed his lawyers to write to the assembly. According to him, he has a 10-year contract with the assembly to operate a 40-seater toilet facility. My lawyer is writing to them. As an assembly, they will be given a 30-day notice to rectify the issue. We've been here for the past 30 minutes trying to seek answers from officials as the letter being used to take over the public facility by the NPP activist is signed by the municipal chief executive, Madame Evelyn Na Ajele Chum Dramera. However, none of them is available to speak to us. The Minister of Information, Mustafa Abdul Hamid, has pledged to push for the passage of the Right to Information Bill at the next sitting of Parliament. Speaking at the Media Foundation for West Africa's Excellence Conference, he said 17 years is long overdue for the passage of the bill. He has promised that his outfit would implore cabinets to give the necessary approval. For the past 20 years, the Media Foundation for West Africa and its partners have been at the forefront in a fight for press freedom media professionalism and good governance across West Africa. This advocacy has led to multiple independent and diversely owned media across the region. Founder and board member of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Professor Kwame Kakari, reviews the foundation has played major roles in ending dictatorial rules in Burkina Faso and the Gambia. Contributed to the fight of the Gambian people eventually to get to force Yaya Jame out of the country. In Burkina Faso, we mounted a campaign for justice for a journalist, Norbert Zongo, who was murdered. And that civil society movement continued seeking justice, seeking democratization, and ultimately ended in getting rid of the dictatorship of Compare. The executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima, says in spite of the progress made towards press freedom in the region, there's more room for improvement. There are still legitimate concerns in terms of safety for journalists, in terms of the, the quality of journalism in the region. The Minister for Information, Mustafa Abdul Hamid, said without the media, no nation can make progress in its democratic aspirations. He assures of government's commitment to ensuring a better media in the country. He also promised the passage of the Rights to Information Bill. This is something that has been in the works for 17 years. And quite frankly, I think that 17 years is a long time. 
and for whatever reason we need to bring finality to that matter and we are determined that in our government will bring finality to the matter of the right to information bill hopefully by the next sitting of parliament we should be able to take it to parliament The police administration has begun deploying more men to land guard prone areas to deal with the menace. Responding to questions from the media, in a crime inspector general of police, David Asantia Pietu says the menace has become a national threat which should be removed and not be allowed to take root. Activities of armed land guards, according to police, are a major threat to land developers. The land guards are often organized by either landowners and sometimes developers with a primary aim to protect their landed property. These land guards have developed into violent armed group terrorizing people who are developing their lands, especially in the greater Accra region and places with fast housing development. The Inspector General of Police, David Asantia Pietu, linked the development to what he termed complex technical situations. Uh, why are these people land guards' problem and other things? It's not because the police is not able to police areas. But if you look also at our land tenure system, you know, are we able to determine who owns the land, police for example, so that immediately we can know what to do. But if you go and somebody who even owns the land has sold it to many people, it creates a problem then you turn to the police and say that the police should go and handle it. There are also people who legitimately own lands, but they also have land guards. This is a very complex issue, but we are doing as much as we can, in fact also going to engage stakeholders in managing the system. But how is the police going to deal with the land guard issue? It may not be a sudden thing. We are now putting containers at certain langas prone areas and uh, police officers will be put there you know and uh, be to address some of this concern he urged housing owners to use legal means to land dispute warning the youth to be wary of the kind of profession to engage in to other stories, Tichimun's Asta FM, that's 103.9, has been completely raised down by fire. The managing director of the station, Samson Yabua Sumwa, says they lost most of their equipment to the fire. A report by Johnson Tichi. Not even a distress call to the fire service and their swift response could salvage the station. The entire studio, newsroom, transmitting room, Offices, together with all their vital documents, were banned. A tender in April this year cost them huge sums to fix the station before this fire. Staff of the company detected smoke and called in the fire service, but that was little too late. The director of the Astar FM station, Samson Yabua Iswaman, also known as Kasapa, is shocked by latest developments. Everything is gutted. Nothing was left. I mean, your pictures will show the exact situation. From the studios, there's newsroom to offices and transmitters, everything. Astra FM station has 37 permanent workers with thousands of listeners in the country and La Côte d'Ivoire. You're watching Media Live. We have more shortly. Thanks for staying. Some stakeholders in the agricultural sector say infrastructure systems should be strengthened to increase revenue and competitiveness of agri-based exports. The Ghana Investment Promotion Authority says non-traditional export earnings dropped by 2.3% in 2016. For the revenue of traditional exports to increase, agricultural produce in the country should conform to applicable standards for export to international markets. At a forum organized by the Ghana Standards Authority on Quality Infrastructure Services for Agriculture and Food Export, the Director General, Professor Alex Dodu, said food safety and quality requirement 
cannot be overlooked in agri-based exports. If all exporters come to us as the law requires, for us to ensure that the standards that of the countries they are exporting to are met, I think business will move very fast and the industrializing agenda will move on very, very fast quickly. Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Eric Amuakuchum, says the authorities put in measures in place to reach its target of $10 billion from non-traditional export NTEs in the next four years. We are going to exceed the targets as opposed to uh, last year, 2016. Uh, but then, you know, now the focus is also moving away from just the uh, exporting of the raw produce and adding value. And of course, when you add value, uh, the value also basically increases. Other speakers at the forum noted improved marketability of agricultural products, food safety, and increasing productivity of local value chains would increase the country's export revenue. And industrialization is critical in engendering economic development. TV3 Business throws a searchlight on the Ayesu Start factory at Bojasi in the central region in a three-part story that focuses on Ghana's need to industrialize. The Ayensu Starch Factory was inaugurated in 2004 as the hub of starch production in Ghana. It collapsed in 2006 due to lack of raw material supply, power outages and spare parts needed to run the factory. But that seems to be the story of the past. As part of measures to revive the factory, government in 2015 entered into a public-private partnership with Tiberius Ghana Limited which acquired a 70% majority share, while government maintained 30%. The new owners did major retrofitting works on the plant during the entire half of the year and began test runs in July and full production in August this year, but ran into problems with its dryer, which has been resolved. The factory currently can process between 100 and 150 tons of cassava daily. Farmers who intend supplying cassava must call ahead and make arrangements for them to be put on schedule. Cassava is perishable. And so if we buy after a day or two, if it is not processed, it is started going waste. And so we needed them to understand that if it is in the ground, you are okay. The moment you pull it out and you bring it to us and we are unable to process, we, we still owe you your money and we have to pay you even though we are losing the cassava. So it is very important that they work in sync with us. As soon as we can take it, we'll, we will arrange with you, give you the right time to bring it. The plant installed capacity is 75 metric tons of starch daily, but is currently working at half of its capacity, giving an output between 22 and 23 metric tons of starch daily. When this factory works and works well, it is a very good income generating avenue for our rural people. And we want to help in that. We are happy to see them earn a livelihood off our back. And we are encouraging the farmers not to plant two acres at once and harvest at once. Stagger your production, your farming all year round so that every month you earn income because this factory will be here for you. And out grower farmers with the Ayesu Start factory have expressed dissatisfaction with management over delays in payment for their produce. Citing the starch factory at Bodrasi was to give the rural dwellers a means of livelihood. The facility operates a farmer outgrower scheme. This means the farmers cultivate cassava and sell the produce to the factory. The factory currently has about 120 acres of farmland which has been cultivated. The cassava variety planted here is high in starch content and is given out freely to the farmers. This is the demonstration farm of the Ayesu starch factory. And what is happening is farmers are harvesting the cassava and in a day they harvest between 30 and 50 tons. In other jurisdictions, over 70 tons of cassava per hectare yield is obtained. However, in Ghana, between 25 and 40 tons per hectare is realized. Kojo Mesa is the chief farmer. 
and the problem that we had on the machine uh, machine was not working well and it let us stop harvesting mm -hmm. but as of now we can see that the machine is operating well so we are happy to give the machine enough cassava for okay. operation other workers complain on the wages they receive asking the factory management to be forthcoming readily with their wages our worry is about money we are always paid after the month i am old and i have children the managing director promised to find solution to it we are addressing that they've raised this with us i think we've been paying them monthly and they don't want it that way they want it earlier so we are trying we are considering doing it bi-weekly so that every two weeks uh, they are paid i think they will be more comfortable with that than the monthly payments we have sports next Thanks for staying. It's time for sports. And as we build up to the 2017 MTN FA Cup Finals in Tamale, head coach of Akra Hatso Folk says the encounter between his side and Kotoko is a derby game, but his boys are ready to win. The same as every other time. You know, we will, uh, we'll deal with the specifics after this game on Sunday and prepare for it in more detail uh, then. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a derby, it's a cup final, it's a one-off game. Uh, so we will we, we'll be really going for it, absolutely. But, I'm sh but we know that Kotoko will as well. So we'll just see how we see how we fare. I've got a squad of players that are uh, absolutely capable of winning, winning the cup. And, uh, uh, you know, they'll be ready and focused uh, for, for the what's, what lies ahead for them. And after guiding the Black Starlets through the African qualifiers for the 2017 FIFA Under-17 World Cup in India, which was their first time since 2007, but fell short of a quarter-final stage following their 2-1 defeat to West African neighbours Mali, despite his inability to win any laurel head coach of the side, Parquisi Fabian says he derives satisfaction from seeing the nation provide appropriate structures to nurture football talents from the grassroots. I think uh, we should pay particular attention to grassroots football, especially the youth football, Look at what England is doing. They are now investing heavily in their youth system. They've already won the under 20, and they are already, they are already, already in the finals of the under 17 too. So if we really want to build a, a, a future for Ghana football, the government should pay attention to the youth system, how it is run, so that uh, more talent will be on earth and nurtured for, for mother Ghana. Back to the FA Cup and the committee has rescheduled the FA Cup finals between rivals Kumasi Asante Koto and Accra Hearts of Oak from the initial 5 p.m. kickoff to 3 p.m. There were growing concerns among stakeholders that the 5 p.m. kickoff time was not safe for fans. The situation necessitated the Ministry of Youth and Sports to compel the committee to bring the game forward to 3 p.m. Sunday's MCN FA Cup finals between Kotoko and Hearts of Folk will be the first time the two clubs face each other since 1990. Next, we bring you the EPL fixtures. That's all for sports. Next, we have international news. 
We now go for entertainment and the Ghana Music Rights Organization, GAMO, has threatened to delete all ghost names from its register. Chairman of the group, Rex Omar, said he would be more effective than legal litigations which stalls development. He spoke to Ajo Saimofa. The Ghana Music Rights Organization, GAMRO, will remove all names found in its register illegally. Chairman of GAMRO, Rex Omar, said the organization will not waste time to take legal actions against people whose names are found in its register. If, let's say, you, had, you delay, say, 500 names and you are going to take all of them to court, I mean, we wouldn't waste our energies on that. When we see that you, are, you don't deserve it, you, you, we delete you and we'll move on. He said as and when the ghost names are identified, they will be deleted and such people will no longer have any transaction with Gamru. Talking about distribution, the Gamru chairman said musicians who have not assigned their rights to Gamru to collect any royalties are not entitled to any monies from the organization. Anybody who have not assigned his right to Gamru, if you like, go and collect your monies yourself because don't dream that you haven't assigned your right for Gamro and Gamro will go and collect money and come and give to you. What power does Gamro have to go and collect your money? You haven't assigned any right to them. So any money Gamro goes to collect, the money will be distributed to its members. He further noted that musicians who have passed away are still entitled to their royalties provided paperwork procedure for inheritance are received by the organization. He stressed the organization is managing a register with names of people who are not musicians. Anywhere there is election, it's politics because there are no systems for you to actually check. So they'll just register anybody so that during election they'll get more votes. And this is what has uh, and brought about these things. And that's all for midday live this afternoon. I am Wendy Lai. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.